This is Dr. Andrew Young at St. John's, and today we're going to speak about partial knee replacement, and specifically the indication of an osteochondral defect with osteonecrosis. Those are big words. It sounds complicated, but we're going to try to break this down in terms of location and the methodology and how we approach the problem. So an osteochondral defect is a disruption of the knee bone at the surface. And the confusing part is that all three of these names point to the same problem. So an osteochondral defect refers to the location. So the pathology occurs at the junction of the bone and the cartilage surface, and there's a defect. So it's called OCD. This is very different from osteochondritis desiccan, which happens in children and adolescents. This is an osteochondral defect in older or more mature patients. The second name that we call it is avascular necrosis, or osteonecrosis, or spontaneous osteonecrosis. And this refers to the pathology of why this problem happens. Essentially, bone is a solid living part of the body, just like other part of the, every other part of the body. It requires oxygen and nutrients. There's a direct disruption of the blood supply to the bone, and the bone subsequently dies. That's called avascular necrosis. And the location is at the osteochondral junction. And then finally, the third, the third thing that this is called is an insufficiency fracture, which is a change to the structure of the bone. So the bone itself is solid at the surface, but because of necrosis, the bone becomes weak and brittle and eventually breaks. It creates an insufficiency or a pathologic fracture. So the problem in the knee can be referred to as any of these three, but they all refer to the same thing. I'll show you what an insufficiency fracture looks like. It's right over here. So just to orient you in terms of context, this is the femur, this is the tibia, and when we look at the surface of the bone, this condylar surface, we should see a nice clean line. This tells us that the structural integrity of the bone is intact and there can be a clear, efficient transfer of load between these bones. But we look over at this knee, the outer column of the knee shows a very clear line, but if we look over here, there's a clear disruption right here. So this is the, the problem internally. This is what we call the osteochondral defect. It's happening right there at the surface of the bone where there should be a transfer of load between the femur and tibia. I'll show you what this looks like uh, on a drawing and then what it looks like in an MRI. So here we see the osteochondral defect. The outer column has healthy bone, but over here we can see a disruption. We can see that there is not a smooth convexity over here, and we can also see a cystic change. What that looks like when we open the knee is this. We can see there's a hole in the bone. It looks a lot like a cavity. Healthy cartilage is nice and white and rounded, but in the area of the osteochondral defect, in the area of the necrosis or the insufficiency fracture, we can see a breakdown of the structural integrity. I'll show you what that looks like on an MRI. On an MRI, we also get another way to visualize the medial femoral condyle. So in this fat sagittal coronal image, we can see the inner column and the outer column. And here, healthy bone appears nice and white. This is the lateral column, it corresponds to this outer lateral column. But over here, where we see this black hole or this black cyst, that's our insufficiency fracture. And again, it has three different names. It's an osteochondral defect because it's occurring at the junction of the bone and the cartilage. It's called osteonecrosis because the bone is dead, which is the pathology of why the bone cracked. And then it's also called an insufficiency fracture. And we can see the surface of the bone is broken. So the primary course of treatment, uh, anytime there's pain in the knee, of, of, is, is conservative. We always give the knee time to see if a patient's symptoms will improve. Even though these lesions look awful, they're not dangerous, they're not harmful, they're just extremely uncomfortable and frustrating and restrictive. So we always allow patients an opportunity for conservative treatment to see if their knee can adapt to this insufficiency fracture. But for those that don't, we then pursue surgery. And then it's clear that we have to correct this primary problem. The first thing that we do is we get a CT so we can image this defect in three planes, the location, the size, and the depth. And here we, we can see on our 3D reconstruction, looking at it from the side, here we see the condyle, the bone, healthy bone is nice and white. We get to the area of the insufficiency fracture, you can see the bone is collapsed and broken, and now it's filled with cyst, and then it continues on. So it's like a big hole in the bone. When we look at it from the front, this is the inner column, this is the outer column, healthy bone should be nice and smooth with a regular surface. You can see the breaks in the bone, a floating piece of cortex right there, and a cystic structure. 
we then use these images on our 3D modeling to map out how we're going to correct the problem. So we can see there's a disruption of our surface from the femur down to the tibia. This area is no longer able to transfer weight. So what we do is we take this and then we model that and then we put on top of it the implant that we plan to use. And we choose an implant that matches the posterior cortex or the contours. And then we know exactly where the sizing should be so we have a clear transition from the front to the back of the knee. We then model the size in the anterior posterior or what we call the sagittal plane. We can see the defect here. We'll then look at that and our sagittal image will place our implant so that it tracks in relation to the tibia and that it covers the defect and restores the contour in the area where it's collapsed. Now, at the time of surgery, once we've confirmed our registration, we'll go ahead and fix the, fix the knee. Now, again, the, the best way to think of that osteochondral defect is as if it were a cavity. And just like a dentist fixes a cavity, we'll use a burr to clean out the necrotic tissue at the surface until we get to healthy bleeding bone. So we'll bring in our robotic tool. This tool has already been programmed based on our preoperative planning to the appropriate depth, length, and width so we know exactly what size implant we're going to put on there. We use this burr to clean up the cavity and prepare the bony surface. Once the bony surface is prepared, then we'll then cement on our implant. This implant will recreate the smooth condylar surface so the knee can transmit load through the inner column like it did prior to the osteochondral defect. So we can see preoperatively we've got an intact outer column, we've got this defect on the inner column. Afterwards, we've got the intact outer column, but now we have a cap and a cushion so that there can be an efficient transfer of load between the bones. So the management of osteonecrosis or osteochondral defects can be confusing just because of the naming. So oftentimes I see a patient who comes in with a diagnosis, several different diagnoses, avascular necrosis, osteonecrosis, osteochondral defect, and insufficiency fracture. So importantly, it's Importantly, uh, one should know that all these refer to the same underlying problem. It's a defect at the surface on the inner part of the knee. Again, most patients will be given an opportunity to adapt or improve with conservative treatment. Only when that fails do we proceed with surgical treatment. Sometimes the osteochondral defect is so big that we have to fix the entire knee with a total knee replacement. But many times we see a very localized focal defect. And we know that ahead of time from the CT scanning that we do. Once we're confident that it's localized to one area, we know that we can do a partial knee replacement. We then use the computer imaging to size and place our implant and then use the burr to clean up the cavity. And then we'll cement the implants into place so that postoperatively the patient can bear weight and transfer load and no longer walk on that broken part of the bone. Thank you very much.